In cybersecurity, the term exploit is used to represent a piece of code, data, or sequence of commands that take advantage of a vulnerability. The code is usually broken down into three distinct sections, consisting of the exploit used to gain access, the shellcode injected directly after the exploit, and in most cases, a payload that immediately follows a shellcode and carries out the malicious intent of the attacker. When used together, these three parts make up what we refer to as the exploit, which can be delivered locally or remotely against a vulnerable application. This little code that you see here is actually log4j, which experts have called the single biggest vulnerability of our time. In this video, we'll break down the anatomy of an exploit and how each of these parts work together to gain unauthorized access into a system. We'll also review a multi-tier defensive approach to help defend against each phase of the exploit attack. The term exploit is broadly used to explain an attack against a vulnerability, but more specifically, it starts with a piece of code that is intended to do something that was not originally intended by the developers. In reality, the first step is to break or crash the vulnerable software. This is the first and most important step of compromising a machine because it opens a door that ultimately leads to unauthorized access. A popular exploit that we mentioned earlier is the recent Log4j, which Tenable referred to as the single biggest and most critical vulnerability of the last decade. Log4j, or Log4Shell, might be the worst exploit that we have ever seen due to several factors, including how easy it is to execute and the widespread use of Apache web servers. In this vulnerability, an attacker leverages the Java naming and directory interface to perform a request for a malicious resource. The attacker places this JNDI command to download a stealth loader Trojan. The Trojan installed crypto mining software on the victim machine. In this example, the first part of the string is the exploit command that is targeting the vulnerable server. This second section is a shellcode that runs directly after the exploit, telling the machine what to do next after the exploit has gained access. In this case, it's instructing the victim to download a Trojan using PowerShell, but we'll talk more about shellcode in the next section. This particular exploit may be referred to as remote execution, and it comes from not properly sanitizing the input validation from the Java application. In this case, the actual exploit was a JNDI command you see on screen, which requests a malicious resource, which can be referred to as the payload. Many other kinds of exploits exist depending on the intended purpose of the attack and the delivery mechanism, whether it's remote, local, or client-based. Some of the other more common exploits include buffer overflows, remote execution, which we just saw, cross-site scripting, denial of service, SQL injections, and of course, many others. One of the more popular exploit types is the buffer overflow. This type of attack varies greatly based on many factors, but ultimately its goal is to introduce a system or kernel crash by overflowing the memory buffer reserved for the application that is vulnerable. Once the application or system crashes, the goal is to insert malicious data in the memory buffer where the application was residing. From there, a common attack is to attempt to jump into a more privileged place in memory called jumping the stack. This is where the exploit points to shellcode which contains machine level instructions that we'll review in the next section. Let's look at a high level example of a buffer overflow in action. Let's assume that an application has requested your username as text input. The application has reserved eight bytes of memory to store the username. An attacker that knows the input variable can only hold eight bytes of memory will attempt to overflow this buffer by inputting 10 bytes. These extra two bytes will then contain real code that can alter the execution of the program. When the vulnerable application attempts to save this 10 byte value, the application crashes and the two extra bytes are actually overwriting into another portion of memory. The overwritten part of memory now has these two bytes of real code that can then attempt to do other things such as jump into a more privileged space in memory or run other kinds of shellcode. It's important to note that the buffer overflow is one of many types of exploit. In the buffer overflow example, the exploit inserts these two bytes of code into memory, which is used to execute the second part of the attack, which is a shellcode. The shellcode is typically written in assembly language because it involves memory and it's a carefully crafted instruction that tells the machine what to do at specific points of execution. Once a vulnerable system has been successfully exploited via buffer overflow or some other type of attack, the shellcode is the instruction that comes next. Going back to our log4j example, you'll notice that the code actually has these two parts. The first part, which is the exploit, which we said earlier is a JNDI remote execution command. And the second part, which is actually a PowerShell command, which translated from base64 means to download this malicious file from textbin.net. This first part is the exploit. The second part is a shell command that we want to run on the victim machine. 
Together, both parts make up a successful exploit. The shellcode can be any type of payload that contains malicious code that you want to execute on the victim machine once the exploit has actually opened the door. Log4j was a rare example of a relatively simple type of exploit that had major ramifications. In this case, the shellcode is simple to understand because we're sending a remote command to be executed. In more advanced exploits, things are rarely this easy. In fact, even in the simplest of buffer overflows examples, you rarely get to put your overflow code into the section of memory that is privileged to run the code that you want to execute. This is where jumping the stack techniques attempt to use pointers to redirect your code into more privileged sections of memory. While the shellcode can be considered a type of payload, this is the part of the exploit that is usually about doing just enough to get into the machine. Oftentimes, another type of payload is introduced as a third and possibly final step that sets up an attacker with a more persistent entry to the vulnerable application. After a successful exploit, an attacker may opt to include another type of payload which includes malware to carry out a specific attack, like a Trojan, reverse shell, or remote access tool. These can be used to gain further access later on. If we look again at our Log4j exploit, we'll see that the shellcode actually triggers the download of a bit mining Trojan. In this example, the Trojan being downloaded is the payload and the final part of the successful exploit because it accomplishes the goal of this particular attack, which is to run bit mining code on all infected systems. Several different frameworks exist for the kind of payload we want to run on the victim machine once the exploit has gained us access. Meterpreter is one kind of payload that itself includes a suite of tools that an attacker can commonly use on the compromised machine. With the Meterpreter payload injected after the exploit, an attacker can do things such as retrieve hash jumps from the SAM database, escalate privileges, turn on and use webcam features, drop into the shell prompt, automatically cover up the tracks which removes logs that may have been triggered during the compromise, and many, many other functions. Several free and commercial tools exist to protect against most of the techniques that we've discovered in this video. But like all things in security, nothing is a silver bullet and a multi-tiered defensive approach is necessary. It starts with secure coding of the application or software and making sure that proper security practices are in place during the time of development. Several great resources exist from Microsoft, OWASP, and others that provide developers with best practices to use such as input validation and data sanitization. Beyond secure coding, we need to protect the OS or the firmware on which the software or application are running. Memory protection techniques like DEP and ASLR can help mitigate against some buffer overflow attacks. There's also CSI benchmarks, which are configuration baseline and best practices for how to properly configure your operating system and network infrastructure. Beyond the OS, we need to protect at the network layer, and that means following the principles of zero trust and least privilege. Locking down unnecessary ports and other best practices should be applied here. Of course, you can't talk about software without mentioning patch management policies, which are a crucial step in making sure that your applications and operating systems are up to date. This is perhaps the best ROI on protecting against these kind of attack, yet it's also one of the most overlooked. Sitting at the network and system layer is the IDS or IPS system. Intrusion prevention or detection systems are specifically designed to look for known exploit signatures. The keyword here is known, which means that it won't do anything in the way of protecting against zero days, which are not yet publicly known. Even still, a good IPS device is a nice safety net to help protect you in between the time that a vulnerability is known and the time you can actually patch your software. Well, that wraps up this video, but I hope you found it informative. If you found any value in this video, I do hope that you take a quick moment to hit like down below. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing if you want to see more cybersecurity and tech related content. This is Andy with the CISO Perspective. And until next time, stay safe and thanks for watching.